Hi, I'm Ed Parco, your host of Inner Edison. I'm here to help entrepreneurs tell their story. I want to uncover people's Edison moments and be able to share what they've learned from life's mistakes. Our greatest growth comes quite often from our greatest failures. Today's guest is Lisa Kipps Brown, and let's welcome her and get to know her story. Hello, Lisa. How are you doing? Hey, Ed. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. It's great to see you. Yeah, same here. Um, so most people won't know, you actually had me on your little live last week or so. And um, and through that, I got to know a little bit about you and the, the fa fact that you're a business owner and that you were used to be a CPA and certain things and you changed careers. And I thought I'd like to have you on and talk about your journey and your Edison moments. So mm -hmm. do you want to tell the pe my listeners a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yes, I did. I graduated in accounting from Virginia Tech. So, hey, Hokies, if there are any of y'all out there. But um, even though I was really good at numbers, it, I very quickly realized that was not the field for me, unless I could have been like a forensic accountant, because that would have been exciting. But um, passed the CPA exam and all that. But I was just like, this isn't doing it for me. And I always knew I would be an entrepreneur, but I, even as a child, but I really had no clue what I would do it in. So fast forward a little bit, my husband, I met my husband over at Virginia Beach. He's a sailor, Nate, now he's retired Navy. And after we had our kids, we were living in Florida and he was getting ready to retire and there was a recession in Jacksonville. We couldn't have sold our business. I mean, we couldn't have sold our home. There were no jobs, this, that, and the other. So I started our first business when our daughter was four months old and our son was 24 months old. And then within that first year, his dad, who had Alzheimer's, moved in with us. So basically I had three toddlers then. And so, but that was my first business. And um, we ran that for three years and then sold it, then started another one. But really it gets more interesting in 95 when I was the controller for an international software company and I discovered web design. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect because... I can use my business acumen and my entrepreneurial experience and my logic and put it all together in a way that's more fun for me. So I stopped accounting entirely and started my business in 1996 with web and marketing strategy. And I've been doing it ever since, which is really funny, Ed, because if you look at my background, everything on there is like two to two and a half years every job or every business I owned. And now I've been doing this for 25. So when you find your thing, you find it. And um, so what do you like so much about this, uh, the new, your current job that you like, your business that you did, that you've been doing it for 25 years? Like so somebody asked me, I can tell them, but what what is your reason you like what you do so well? Well, I love it because it's constantly changing. I don't have to worry about being bored because the internet, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, the internet's, you know, it's not going to change much anymore. No, we are still just barely scraping the surface. So I love that I get to be part of something that's constantly evolving. I love that I'm able to help other people, um, especially small businesses. That's who I work with mostly is small businesses. And then I also work with economic development organizations, but that's still helping other small businesses. So putting those two things together, the creativity, not being bored, combining it with being able to impact other people's lives is just the perfect combination for me. So how has your business changed over the 20, last 25 years? Because I know when I got in the mortgage industry, we were using fax machines and certain things. <laughs> and they're, they're, you know, we do stuff now within seconds that used to take days. So yeah. how is, I mean, uh, that's got to be a mark because it used to change like every 10 years now and then five years. It's got to be changing like every three, four months, six months, oh, right? even is faster. Yeah. So when I first started, I literally had to use a text editor to create a website. You had to use a text editor, type in the code, upload it. Well, well and, and for people who are too young to know, you had to connect on dial up. So, you know, that, that all sound, wait for it to connect. Then you had to upload the files through FTP, which is file transfer protocol. Then you had to open your browser, refresh it, see if it works. So it was this long process. Um, so that's one big way is that now, not only do you not have to code by hand, you can if you want to. There are a lot of things that I still will go in and code by hand or tweak. But there are all these platforms out there that almost anybody can 
create a website that looks nice. Doesn't mean that it is going to really meet their strategy, but it can still look great. And it used to be that you really had to be a geeky nerd to even be able to have a website at all. So as you say, it's much easier, but then I think a lot of people find out that they still need someone to help them along the way to help them set it up, certain th things. So what is your process? Do you, you want to kind of get into that? Pro what do you want? I mean, I should ask you, what do you want to talk about today? Because I'm fascinated about your story. What's, you know, what Edison moments have you had along the way in 25 years? Um, I'm sure you have a couple of them. Yeah. Uh, many of them, but I would say the main one was well into the life of my business that I had already owned it for 16 years. And for, so for 16 years, I'd been helping clients use the internet, use the web to adapt their business to meet challenges in their industry or in their own personal life. So ironically, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and my husband and I became our, her caregivers. I moved in with her and our husband stayed at our house a few miles away. But rather than doing for myself what I had been doing for other people for 16 years, I went off the deep end and I went and hired somebody because I thought I needed help running the business. I had employees and I, did, I convinced myself that I needed to start building the business more like everybody else does, which is one of the reasons I never, ever, I mean, I've always been the type of person that did everything differently. And all of a sudden, I, it's like I lost my mind. And I think all of us are too close to our own things. So I hired this person and I started almost like abdicating to that person. And we started providing a lot of services that I never really wanted to be into print design and all that. And anyway, long story short, it was a really poor decision to hire the person. And I spent the last six months of my mother's life saving my business because it almost bank, it almost went bankrupt because of things, effects of hiring that person um, without getting into that. But it was like, once one thing happened, it was like a snowball effect every day. It was something else. And so that's one thing that y'all need to be really, really careful about. Pay attention to the little signs. I knew that I didn't like managing people. So when I was noticing these signs, um, I would be like, oh, well, it's just because of me. And I would force myself to not intervene and not be the micromanager. And it bit me in the ass. Did. <laughs> so that was the light bulb came on for me that I made this huge mistake of not following my own way of thinking like I always had. And what that also did is it really helped me realize how many people do need help when they're at some moment of transition in their life, whether that's that they want to retire, so they want to be able to get their business ready to sell for retirement whether it's that they've been laid off and they need to sell a business or whether it's somebody like me that needs to become, become a caregiver. So I became, it became my passion to really, really apply what I had been doing for all those years, but in a way that's more targeted to help people who really need help then. So you brought up, cause I remember you, so let me back up a second. So a lot of people don't know how we met. We met through Steve Sims. And like I say, he needs to pay us every time we say his name. Um, but And I find by doing Inner Edison that um, it's very lonely at the top as a business, business owner. And you need to have those coaches, mentors, yeah. corner men, whatever you want to call them, there for you so that you can meet other people like yourself who think the same. No, I don't want to say think the same way as you do, but have the same issues. Yeah. And when... Yeah. So, I mean, that's really important. So mm -hmm. is that what you ran into? Yes. I'm, Ed, that's one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. I, I say that the hire was the biggest mistake, but truly, if I had had a coach, I would not have made that decision. So, yeah, I highly recommend to anybody, anybody who's an entrepreneur knows that it can be one of the loneliest things in the world. And people are like, well, I don't understand that. You have a husband, you know, you have lots of friends. But no, you have to be around people 
who are in the same situation as you. Not exactly the same, but they understand what you're going through. They understand the challenges. You can provide each other feedback, moral support. It's almost like being in the military, not not to diminish the military, but you know, veterans feel better if they're around other veterans because they know, they understand each other, even if they never work together. And it's kind of like that. So yes, I highly recommend a coach, a mastermind, um, just other businesses, other owners, peer group, and even a therapist if you need it. But yeah, Steve is my coach now, and it's one of the best things I've ever done for myself. Yeah. I mean, and because what's nice is a lot of times you're around people not in the same industry as you. So you're able to find out, oh, they kind of, they do it this way. Maybe I should do that for my business or this other stuff, or they run into certain things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that it's just unique that you need to have these people in your life to, as you're growing your business, because you probably wouldn't have made that mistake, but that you made the prior one we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But I mean, or you might have made it and known faster what you needed to do. Exactly. Right. You are exactly right. Because if I had, instead of staying in my own head and second guessing myself and just saying, oh, you know, it's just because I don't like to manage people, you know, it's so I don't want to be a micromanager. Instead of staying in my own head, if I had actually been speaking with other business owners or a coach, they would have been able to validate to me, no, you really are thinking the right thing. Or even if I was thinking the wrong thing, they would have been able to help guide me. And I know that I would not have ended up in as bad of a situation as I did. Thankfully, I saved the business. And now this is my 25th anniversary year of starting the business. But I, if I think about it, I still have a lot of sorrow because those last six months of my mother's life, a lot of beautiful memories were robbed from me because of the overpowering fear of what was going on. I was still her caregiver, but, you know, I couldn't give 100 percent to her. Right. But then let's so with that, that 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 happened to you. I yeah. see from what I'm hearing, you actually changed how your business was going forward and how you focused more on, was it just people retiring from the business and focus? Cause I know you wrote a book called boomers something, right? Boomer What's the name cash of the book? Out. Um, right. I wrote that for a couple of reasons. First of all, because I knew that there are so many people like myself who are too close to their business. So they're not making good decisions, but Mostly I wrote it because I was sick of telling my clients why they have to do certain things with the internet, especially older people. They're like, oh, I've been doing it like this forever. I don't need to do that. And I'm like, uh, if you ever want to be able to sell to somebody younger, yes, you do. So I was getting really aggravated with that. And then I thought, you know what? I'm just going to put it in a book because then if I put it in a book, they'll pay more attention because immediately they're like, oh, if it's written, it must be more important. So I literally in one weekend wrote what basically the whole big picture that I try to paint to clients. Um, but so, yeah, I wrote that to, to really try to help people understand why they need the internet and why they need to use the web strategically and how they can use it to literally make their own business more valuable, more marketable, more likely to be able to sell when they want to retire instead of closing down. Only a third of small businesses ever sell. All the rest close down. And so if you think of the lost wealth, if you will, and the majority of business owners have the vast majority of their wealth tied up in their business. So, you know, a lot of us don't have 401ks. We haven't invested in a lot of stocks and things because we've been investing in ourselves. So that that's the thing behind that book. And I did, I wrote it just a couple of years after my mother died. All right. So I want to go back, stay on this for a little bit, if you okay. don't mind. So how, so let's talk about how, as, so we're all, I'm talking about everybody's at moments of when, you know, but let's talk about how do you sell your business? Because I don't think a lot of people think about that as they're building their business. What's their out strategy? How do I get out of this business once I grow it? And you're right. We put all of our time, energy, money back in our business. We don't, you know, we're not always putting in other places and, and you know, separate. So let's focus. Can you focus? Do you mind focusing on that to help? No, people I don't mind process? at all. So um, why don't you start, when should you start thinking about it? What's the process and go out if you don't mind sharing that part? 
Okay, ideally, you should start thinking about it when you start it. Because here's the thing, Ed, nobody wants to buy a job. And a lot of us, what we do is we build ourselves a job. That all we're doing is working, working, working in our own business. We've got our nose to the grindstone to you know keep cash flow going. And we haven't taken a step back and thought, how can somebody else take this over? How can somebody else run this business? Does it have any value to anybody without me? And the vast majority of small business owners, the answer is no. You know, and or even if it's a business like a retail shop that obviously has inventory and so forth, well, anybody can buy inventory and put it in there. So what is it about your business that would make somebody go, yes, it's worth it to me to pay this person for their existing business over starting my own? Um, from day one or as soon as you can, you need to figure out processes and systems. And, and it doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but document everything that you do and how you're doing it and figure out ways that you can teach other people how to do it um, or automate it. Like for me, I don't like having a lot of employees. I only have three now. So for me, it's more about using automation and things like that and developing intellectual property, d developing different types of, of digital products, if you will. But um, for most people, what you need to focus on is pretend, let's be morbid, pretend you're dead tomorrow. What's going to happen to your business? Can it keep running? And for most people, the answer is no. Does that make right. sense? No, it totally makes sense. <laughs> I was just thinking if I died tomorrow, will my business keep going? My plan for myself was, is to sell it to my employees or, you know, but keep building it and then sell it to the employees and, and let them purchase it because that's, you know, I have a lot of women in my company, actually, I should say all women. And the, I think they wouldn't be able to, I mean, I, I think everybody can as a woman. I'm just saying they might not go out and start a company like right. I've done because, of the you know, a lot of them are risk averse. You know, I know my wife is, that's why she's a nurse. And mm -hmm. so for, uh, you know, most people, they don't think about, I'm going to, I want to own a company, but then if you can sell it to them as an employee and that's employee owned, then yeah. I think it's a little different. So think, let's go back. All right. So how do you set it up? So you just said systems and certain things. And, um, and also is there, there's, ins I know you're not in this, but there's insurance policies you can put in place, key man or other things yeah, right? yeah, there are. along the way that you're, you know, so. Yeah. Cause the only reason I brought that up about selling the, selling the business, because you were talking about, you know, boomers, you know, your book is mm -hmm. about basically, cause I mean, most people are going to listen to this and you know, younger ones go, why wouldn't you be on the internet? Why do you have to tell people to be yeah. on there? You know what I mean? They don't understand that in nineties, it was a new thing. It was brand right. new. It was like, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. It was not something that had been around forever. Our kids, my kids and my grandkids are going to be having it the moment they wake, you know, they're born, it's right in their hand, right? Their phone. So it's a little different. So for you to explain to older people, and I don't mean that wrong because I'm one of them. No, um, I know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, about, <laughs> hey, this is, you, you been, so I don't care. <laughs> yeah. You've been building this business forever. You need to make sure that you have these things in there because a lot of people don't think about it. I mean, I, and I'm going to go one more step here. So when we're looking at building our house up in the foothills, we're dealing with a cabinet place they have a fax machine. They have no internet. They don't have email. Yeah. They're, you know, they're, uh, I think they're German Baptist. So it's a little, so when you're dealing with something like that, that's a different because of who they are, but right. everybody needs, if they're going to want the, you know, you, you can't, I can't even imagine not being on the internet. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, it's not just being on the internet. Obviously younger people, they're on there from, you know, the time they're born. But the, the funny thing is, I mean, I have clients in my early 20s that really don't know much more than people in their 60s just because they know, yeah, I want to be on TikTok. I want to do this. I want to do that. Just because they know how to do those things doesn't mean that they're using them strategically. And it doesn't mean that it's adding really any value to the company. But I'll give you an example of when I say processes and systems, sometimes it can seem overpowering because it feels like writing code or something. But there's a young man who was on my show, Matt Deutschman, and he owns a business called Double Take Promotional Marketing. Well, he built it in New York. 
and his wife was transferred to Chicago. So they were moving there and he went into panic mode because he thought, oh my gosh, number one, am I going to lose these clients that I have in New York? Because he had built it around himself. You know, they were used to him being the one talking with them. And number two, he knew he wanted to hire people because they were getting ready to have a baby. So he was freaking out and he goes, how can I make them be working with double take promotional marketing and not Matt Deutschman? And so he had to take a step back and he literally started writing down everything he does. And it, it sounds ridiculous, but the first time you speak with a client, what is your process? You know, what are the types of questions you're asking them? Um, how do you help, in his case, how do you help them decide um, what the best promotional product is for them? How, and I mean, he literally goes all the way down through and drills all the way down into how do, how do you place an order? So over the years, he basically created a manual, ended up, that's what it ended up being, a manual for his company, but it's an organic document. It changes all the time. And now he even has staff that update it. But that way, when they hire somebody, here is this thing that anybody can use to help train to train and integrate new employees into the company. So that's a pro, that's processes and systems that Matt can hand that book to anybody who buys it. And they immediately have this asset. It's not just a company that's had customers. And I want to get back to that because for my business, right, it's not no, it's not only about the business, but for me, I focus on myself a lot, right? Because mm -hmm. I, I do loans and I do other things. So yes, I grow the company, but I also focus really on me a lot more because nobody knows the company, but everybody knows me. So I have the same situation that eventually yeah. I need them to know everybody else, not just me. Right? Yes. Yeah. It, it, you, you want them to know you, you want that goodwill that comes along with it, but you want them to think of the company itself also. And then I know from our conversations previously, you do other things like helping advise people on um, how to set up ownership of the home or insurance or, or trust or whatever, because you're looking at the big picture of helping them build their asset since a home is the biggest asset for most Americans. So you're kind of doing the same thing that I'm talking about you're asking them, don't just look at buying a house so that you can move in and use it. Look at how this can become an asset that continues after you're gone and isn't put at risk. So that's an analogy, but it's also something that you need to think about after your employees buy, have they bought the business and you're not there? How can that part of the business continue? Because that's a real value added service that you have that most mortgage advisors, they basically are like, okay, yeah, here's the thing, fill it out. They hook you up with a mortgage and that's it. Most of them, I, I don't think go above and beyond like you do and actually help people plan it as a financial asset. No, I mean, it's, it's a little different. I've been doing this for a while and I've always looked at things differently, you mm -hmm. know, so, and the normal mortgage advisor, doesn't have a master's. So, um, yeah, you know, I look at things a little differently. So, but yeah. this is not about me. This is about you. So they can, they can always find out about me everywhere else on my <laughs> websites, everywhere else. Um, what, so I know that you do a lot of nonprofit work, correct? Mm -hmm. So let's, yeah. let's, I want to talk about, so a lot of entrepreneurs besides building their business, they want to give back. Right. And so they, and the, how they do that is through a nonprofit. They volunteer, they do certain things. Cause myself, if you look at my schedule, non COVID schedule, right. I'm always out somewhere volunteering or running a golf course for somebody or this or that. So what is your, what do you do a lot right now that you, that's a nonprofit for you? Well, I've always volunteered a lot, but over the past couple years, what I've been doing is I've partnered with a NASCAR driver, Colin Garrett, NASCAR Xfinity Series driver. Both of his brothers are active duty Army, and I've partnered with him to help promote free services that help prevent veteran suicide. And so we promote two nonprofits, Pro Bono, um, Racing for Heroes, and the Rosie Network, which provides on um, 
the Rosie Network provides entrepreneurial mentoring and training and Racing for Heroes provides free mental and physical health services, job tra- job training, job placement, that kind of thing. Um, so what we do is we try to help veterans and military spouses, anybody who's in transition, well, they don't even need to be in transition, but anybody who needs help adjusting, we want them to know that these services are available. That And so we promote the nonprofits pro bono, and then we also have programs that small businesses can market with us for as little as 3,500 bucks to be on the car for a race. Now, usually you're talking like a couple hundred thousand dollars to be on the car for a race, even for a really small logo. Um, but so, like I said, we have spots that that start at 3,500. We also do things like last year we crowdfunded for Daytona. We had to stop the crowdfunding because of COVID, but we crowdfunded for Daytona. The goal was 200,000 because it's very expensive to raise. That's how much we needed to raise, but we beat the goal and we were able to pay for stem cell treatments for a veteran who has multiple sclerosis that was caused by exposure to chemicals on active duty. So it's so fulfilling to us because, well, personally, my fa- grandfather killed himself when I was five and my grandmother tried to when I was eight. And I've had, I've lost a few friends um, to suicide. So that cause alone is very important to me. And then with my husband re- being retired military, helping military families transition is extremely important to me because I know how hard it was for us when he retired. Um, you go from feeling like you're making a difference, feeling like you're part of something bigger than yourself to a regular old corporate job that, okay, who cares? Um, so that's why those two causes are so important to me and why I give so much time. I, all the work that I do for that is pro bono. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing because that's one of the reasons I started helping the brave, right? Because that's about transitioning military because when I got out, there was no help for me. I mean, there was yeah. help just for the medical part, you know, to get set up with that kind of stuff. But to actually figure out what to do after that, it's like, all right, here's we gave you five years and whatever and see you later unless you're going to reenlist, right? Yeah, so, and, and you had your MBA, right? When you finished? And I, no, I, I, I finished no, I, I had finished my bachelor's and I was mm-hmm. finishing up my MBA okay. when I was getting out. So and yeah. that's why a lot of people go, Why don't you stay in as an officer? It's like I'm in the Navy. If I would have stayed in, that would have been on line off. You know, I would have been just a regular I would have been on ships all the time, most mm-hmm. of the time. And I did not want to be on ships all the time. Yeah. I know a lot of people like that whole life. That was not mm-hmm. the life for me. I yeah. knew I wanted to, I wanted to get into business and and do this kind of stuff. I mean, I didn't realize, and we talked about this on your show, how much I help. I enjoy helping people in the mortgage industry, but I also help them all the way in all the other stuff that I do. Um, I know, I and that's to... one of the things that I thought was so interesting when I learned more about you, that you had initially wanted to go in the medical field as a child, and you ended up being a corpsman in the Navy and ended up not doing it. You wanted to go into business, but everything that you're doing you're doing in a way that helps other people. And that was the first thing that clicked in my mind is that goes all the way back to why Ed wanted to be in the medical field in the first place, your caring nature, wanting to help people. You may not have even realized at the time that's why you wanted to, but that is underlying everything that you're doing. And I think that's so cool. Thank you. But this isn't a podcast about me. This is a podcast. I know, <laughs> but but let's use you as an example. And even what I said right. earlier about myself of, oh, I'll tell you, money is not a good motivator for me. Never has been, never will. It's not like, it's not that I don't like money. I'm just not into shopping brands, labels. I'm, you know, I don't care about having the, the best car in the biggest house. It's not a great motivator for me. What is a motivator motivator for me is having an impact on people's lives. And so through I can look at throughout the decades of my career, not just work, but also volunteering and pro bono, underlying all of it has been how can I help people, but not just help one person? How can I multiply the effect? and help more people at one time. So my point with that to listeners is, if you think about what I said about myself, think about what Ed said about himself, 
you need to take a step back and think about what are your core values and the things that are really important to you. Not even not even talking about business, but what are the things that are really important to you? And it doesn't have to be things as in a house or whatever. It can be um, making other people feel better. It can be having time with my family, whatever. Once you figure out those things, it makes it so much easier for you to build a business that you're happy in and also for you to find some way that you can give back so that your business is about more than money. And I'm just so lucky, blessed, whatever you want to call it, that right after I started working with Colin, I mean, it was only four weeks after that, probably Racing for Heroes happened to call me and wanted to hire me to do a national awareness campaign for them. They're here in our county, but I didn't really know anything about them. I thought they just did like racing, um, like, you know, having people out racing to build community, which that's awesome, but that's all I thought it was. So once I went out and realized that they have all these free mental and physical health services, they get people off of opioids, they provide counseling, I was just like, oh my gosh. And I knew that they didn't have paid employees. So I was like, okay, if I take any money, I'm taking it directly out of treatments. And hello, even if they have the money to pay me, you can't have a national awareness campaign if you don't have some kind of national platform to build in. And usually that means money paying for advertising. So like I said, it was just luck, blessing, whatever that I have that they happened to call me because I called Colin's dad and they immediately agreed. Yeah, we'll run them on the car for free. So I was able to hand them a national platform and then I've helped them create the national awareness campaign on that platform. But everything I and the Garrett's have done have been pro bono for them. So for listeners, you need to keep your eyes and mind open about yourself, about what the things are that are really important to you. But you also need to keep your eyes and mind open for what's going on around you because you can miss some really awesome opportunities to help people without it without even realizing it. You know, I could have gone in and been like, yeah, well, here's a quote you know, whatever, and this is how much it is. But instead, because it was important to me personally, I took that step back and figured out a way that I could help them. Right. And I think a lot of people don't understand a couple little things I want to bring up. One, you need to figure out, like you talked about, what's important to you in life and, and how, so that you can have that balanced life. There are going to be times throughout building your business that it's going to be imbalanced, but you need to set up to how you want it to be balanced. Um, because some people, it's not about the money. It's about the time to do stuff with their family, the time to do nonprofits, the time to do other things. Whatever that is, you need to find out what your definition of successful is. Exactly. Right, because I, yeah. yeah. Um, my friend Richard Mulholland um, in South Africa, he, he's the founder of Missing Link Presentation Power House. The way he puts it, what is your victory condition? And I love this, what he told me. He said, Lisa, every board game, you know, at the point that somebody has won, you know what the end result is going to be. You might not know who it is, but you know what it takes to win. And he said, Almost all small business owners have no clue of what their victory condition is. What are we working towards? And so they just keep growing and growing and growing. And as he said it, that's cancer, you know, and I just really, the, the victory condition, it clarifies it so much for me. And then also thinking about growth for the sake of growth literally can be cancerous, can be dangerous to you. Um, and it really is about mindset. It's about understanding what is important to you and understanding how can you get closer to what's important to you. If you don't mind, I want to give you an example that's not that didn't start out directly related to business. Is it okay? 
Why wouldn't it be okay? Oh, I don't know. Just want to make sure that I'm not don't like. Ask, we, we don't ask permission around here. We just do. And then we ask forgiveness. That's how well, we Well, I talk so much. I didn't want you to be going, I wish she would shut the hell up. Sorry. You can believe I, that. No. Bill. I, I'm, um, I'm a host. I'm on radio. I know how to shut people up if I want to. Oh, okay, right? good. Um, so one of the people that I have met recently and who happens to be in my upcoming book, but this is not why I'm telling you. He is an entrepreneur now, but he spent 15 years in prison for armed robbery. He went in when he was 23 and he found out a week before he went to prison that he was going to be a father. And he was on my show the other week and we were talking and he said, Lisa, I didn't even know. He said, I knew what a goal was, but I didn't know how to set a goal and I didn't know how to reach a goal. And he talked about sitting down on the floor of his prison cell with a piece of paper and a pen or pencil or whatever they'll let you have in prison. And he just started writing down, number one, I want to get my GED. Number two, I want to be a good father. Number three, I want to take college courses. Number four, I want to um, learn about business. And then he's like, okay, well, I don't know how to even start. How do I start? And he said, well, I don't know how to start, but today I'm going to take classes. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but today I'm going to go sign up for a class. And he approached it that way. And he said, so before I knew it, I had my GED. Then I was taking all these courses and getting certifications. Then I was taking college courses. And it was so inspiring to me that in that setting, he was able to dig deep and understand what was important to him. And as he put it, he said, I had been raised with values and I knew what was right and what was wrong. And I knew that inside I was a good person. And he said, so I started to align my head back with my heart. And that enabled him to, now that he's out, he's he's an entrepreneur. He has a great relationship with his daughter who was born then. She's in college, has a 3.5 GPA, but you know, I look at it, I'm like, if somebody like that can figure out what's important to them and how they can get to it, surely the rest of us can. The difference is the rest of us aren't locked in a room where we're kind of forced to face our our truth, if you will. We can be, right? I mean, yeah, that's you could, true. We can you're be. supposed to sit in a room and figure out where you want to go. I mean, yeah, he was, I mean, that's just because a lot of us think, okay, they're in prison. Oh, well. You know, I mean, that's their fault. They're not going to, they're not going to exactly. accomplish anything. And, you know, and, and our, one of our coaches has his, his little thing that he does with the prisons and go in there. Right. Yeah. As I said, I'm not going to mention his name. Uh, he yeah, should not mention. Yeah. yeah he's, he owes me. I'm, I think he owes me a dollar for every time I say his name. <laughs> Funny. So, yeah. Anyway. Uh, so that's just amazing that, and why wouldn't our listeners want to hear about that? I mean, so basically what you're saying is no matter where you are in life, you need to plan where you want to go in life. And this is all yeah. about, well, but before you do your goals, you need to figure out what that looks like to you going forward. Yes. And right. you have to be prepared. That's the other thing. It doesn't matter what opportunities come along if you're not prepared for them and if you can't recognize them. So the more that you invest in yourself and learn about yourself, the more likely you're going to be a be able to recognize an opportunity when you actually do run across it and be in a spot that you can take advantage of it. Going back to Sean, the guy I was talking about, you know, with all these, well, when I met him, I kind of, I told him, I, I assumed that you were an entrepreneur because you couldn't get a job because my, you know, the impression is once you're a felon, you're done. And he said, no, he said, I actually had three jobs when I came out because hmm. He had gotten all these certifications and he worked one of the jobs. One of his first jobs was working at Burger King. And he said, I treated it like I worked at a five star restaurant. Within a month, they wanted him to go manage another store. That shows you that if you have the right attitude and you invest in yourself and you do whatever it takes to overcome your weaknesses, that if you get in the right spot, you can be successful. Uh, I think one of the typical small business owners' biggest problems, aside from what we talked about, about not knowing what we want, is that they don't dream big enough. 
they're they're looking inside this little box they're looking at other businesses around them and they're basing all of their decisions on what a typical business looks like kind of like i did when i freaked out and was like oh my god i have to hire hire somebody to help me manage this um they just don't dream big enough and i want y'all to think if i could do anything in the world if i could achieve anything what would my biggest dream be if i could make a huge difference in the world what would it be or make a huge difference in my family's life or whatever you have to start dreaming bigger and then when you start dreaming bigger it opens up so many doors to you so basically what you're saying people don't dream enough right they yeah, just focus yeah. on yeah and all those words i used yes they don't dream enough but here's the other thing that goes back I, sorry i didn't mean to make it so small like insufficient i'm yeah, just saying you just need that. to we just need to dream is what we're yeah, saying no yeah. i'm i'm joking with you ed but it also it's great to take a whole bunch of words and distill it down into a thought so when y'all the takeaway you need to learn to dream but that also goes back to what we talked about with the coaches and the masterminds and the peer group one person you can have your ideas and they're all in your head and basically all they have to fertilize them and grow from is what have your experiences and what's in your head the minute you put it out to somebody else it's amplified because they can they can put their experiences and their mindset into it and it is amazing how once you collaborate with other people and i'm not talking about going into business with them i'm talking about just talking and brainstorming it is amazing how a tiny little seed of an idea can morph into something that you literally never ever ever would have dreamed of on your own simply because other minds are in the mix. One plus one doesn't equal two. It it really is a force multiplier to have more than one person brainstorming. Yeah, because I um I can't see certain things about myself, right? What I need to do in this, but other people can see those. I see things where I'm talking to somebody and the light bulb comes on. Why aren't you doing this, this, and this? And that's the one thing about having people around you that in your you know in your mastermind group or the others mm -hmm. to help you see what you're not seeing. Um, because, you know, we we just can't really see that about ourselves, what we need. And I'm not talking about how much of a jerk you are. I'm talking about, you know, yeah, the fact yeah. that what you like, I, you know, I, I help somebody realize what they should do with, you know, they do a lot of lives and, and how to put a course together on how to teach that kind of stuff and other stuff they do. And I'm like, that's basically what you should do, you know, on top of everything else you're doing. But that's really what you should do. So, I mean, yeah. that's what we see in other people. Yeah, it's so much easier to see things in other people than in ourselves because the old saying we're too close to the forest, too close to the forest to see the trees or whatever. Um, I probably screwed that up. But he <laughs> he who shall not be named so he doesn't have to owe you another dollar. I also have his story in the book because he had to be challenged from the outside to end up with the business that he has now. He had a hugely successful business and he liked what he did up to a certain point up to the point of delivery and then it got that he didn't enjoy that part after that but he saw himself as working in this very specific industry and people kept saying write a book write a book write a book and he finally was like fine i'll write a book about how i did it and all of a sudden entrepreneurs start calling him and asking him questions and he said he never would have realized that the assets the natural assets his own natural assets that he used to build that hugely successful business where he worked with billionaires that literally he could pick those assets up and move them over and work with entrepreneurs in other industries and literally help change people's lives instead of just checking something off of somebody's bucket list and i think that is really really cool and it illustrates no matter no matter how successful you are how much money you're making there could be something that you could be doing with the talents that you have and with the things that you love doing that you could be doing it in a different way that makes you so much happier and it's like he put it, he said, I realized that realtors and Cartier had the same problems. 
why wouldn't he be able to help these other people? Right. And they're more appreciative. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. And I mean, he or just say, we are, we are. Yeah. Yeah. He literally helps change, changes people's lives like you and me. And we met because of him. So it's just so much more fulfilling to him. And it's been better for his family life, you know? And so of course he's proud that he had that business had slash has because he still does, but his emphasis now is on the coaching and everything hugely proud that he built that. But once he got into the right sandbox with his toys, if you will, his tools and toys, that's when he really flourished internally, really flourished. And we're speaking about Steve Sims, by the way. Yeah. Um, okay. There's another dollar, Steve. <laughs> no, I just, you know, because a lot of people, I, you know, I sent him to a lot of people to listen to and stuff and they're like, I don't really like that. I'm like, that's fine. He's not for everybody, but yeah. he's definitely for me. And I, I definitely learned a lot from him in the last two and a half years that I've known him. And, and it's just little things that we, you know, w wouldn't normally do. I mean, I'm doing multiple podcasts and other stuff that I'm doing because of talking to him and, and finding out that I have the ability to help people tell their story across multiple mediums, like in the mortgage industry about how to get a loan, you know, the other helping the brave, you know, inner Edison, which we're on right now, um, which is about business owners telling their story so other business owners or other people entrepreneurs along the way understand you're going to run into issues you're going to have little problems but there's ways to get around them and there's people out there to help you and that's right. what i want and you knew that you were doing these things so you could see here's the tree here's you knew that but couldn't see the forest for the trees that's what it is you <laughs> could see your trees but you couldn't step back and see the big picture is that you are helping people communicate, however you put it, communicate with others through different mediums. And Steve could see that and you couldn't. So Correct. Because he actually example. told me that. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, he told me that. He's the one that yeah. told me that because he's like, you don't because remember he had us um, supposed to send a video about what we do, right? And the, yeah. and the problems we solve. And I was telling him, I'm like, you know, this is what I do. Boom, boom, boom. But he goes, so you don't see it, do you? I'm like, no. And then he's like, this is, I'm like, wow. I didn't think of it that way, but yeah, you're totally correct. Yeah. I, that's what I do. And that's what's so important to having these people in your lives and even other us with the strategic group group helping each other out going, okay, I see this, like, you know, I heard today about, you know, how you helped people, you know, help them set up, especially boomers, right? A lot of people yeah. think they're the old people, they're the old, but you know, that same setting up, helping them to sell their business is the same thing the people in the middle of their lives are doing. And the people in the beginning of their lives should be looking at and looking at the fact that if I'm going to build a business, how do I get out of it so I can go do something else? Exactly. And, or what is my long-term you know, goal here? You mentioned earlier, you know, all the young people aren't going to think it's a big deal. Well, hello, young people. One day y'all are going to be old and the internet is going to be totally different than it is today. And you're going to be going, I have no clue what this is. I always tell people, look at the telephone, you know, that, I mean, I was born in 1961. I don't care who knows how old I am. So yeah, the telephone had been around for a long time, but there were still party lines. And if y'all don't know what a party line is, we never had one, but it means like different households or whatever shared. You had you could pick up the phone and listen to your neighbor. You had to wait till they got off the phone for you to call somebody. So back then, even when I was a child, there were party lines. They were, I'm sure there were probably businesses they didn't even think they needed a phone. Why do I need a phone? You know, I'm right here local. Everybody knows me. Fast forward to what a phone is today. It's a computer that we're carrying around in our pocket. Entire industries, even back in the 60s and 70s, entire industries were being built around the telephone. Call centers, you know, spammers, all that stuff. Um, so... That's what y'all need to understand is the internet really right now, I would say, is only at the point that the telephone was when I was a child of that most people have a telephone in their Most people had a telephone in their house then, but they weren't really using it for all the amazing ways that we are now. So y'all young people, don't be all smug with old people like me because you're going to be old one day and the young people are going to be going you don't know what such and such is. <laughs> <laughs> so true. 
spoken just they like just a grandpa. Wanna, like when, I kid, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, you young people these days don't know what's going on. Now you sound just like my grandfather. I know, but still, this is the I thing. I know, but you totally Everybody true. Everybody gets totally true. older, and every, human beings' brains are changing. The way that we think. I mean, even I'm wired differently than most people my age because I've been working online for so many years that it's like my brain is just different. Like I'll try to pinch and zoom a darn book, a piece of paper, you know, because I'm just my right. <laughs> seriously. Um, and I'll be like, if I'm reading a book, if I happen to have a printed book, I'll be like, I want to be able to tap on it and look up the word, you know? So think about that though, in terms of kids that are being born now, they never know anything other than the computer in their pocket. So they they are going to think totally differently. Their brains work totally differently than even the 15-year-old now. So that's what I'm saying that y'all, everybody, regardless of your age, you have to remain curious. You have to continue learning. You have to continue to try to understand how things are evolving or you you end up making yourself irrelevant if you don't. Is that the mic drop time? We're done for today. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Any, all right. So anything else you want to add that, you know, cause that was amazing what you just said. Cause that's totally true. I think it, as everybody gets older, technology changes, things are going to change and, and get newer or whatever. And not everybody's going to stay on it. Cause I even know, like you said, in the beginning of this younger people, some of them, they know how to use a phone and an app on a phone, but they don't know anything else other than that. They don't know how to use Word or any of these yeah. other software to type a letter or you know, if they need to do that. They, you know, and, and the big thing now is don't leave a voicemail if you want to, you know, if you want to get a hold of me, that's what text is for. It's like, but mm -hmm. you know what? For me, I grew up with talking to people. That's what I like to do. I want to hear the tones and inflections in your voice. I want to hear if I tell you something, I can tell you if you I heard it right or wrong within yeah. seconds. But if I text it to you or email it to you, you have a very easy chance of taking it the wrong way. And I have no way to fix it till it's already mm -hmm. gone the other way. So for me, I, I always tell my, you know, my kids still to this day, if you call me and you don't leave me a voicemail, I'm not calling you back. Yeah. Yeah, because hello, if it's not important enough for you to leave a voicemail, why should it be important enough for me to call you back? Um, you are so right. Well, by the way, I think that's why Clubhouse is so powerful. One of the reasons is because you're talking to people and they have a harder time being posers. And, you know, it's really, you can tell a lot about a person by the way they speak. But I was going to say, um, I know the the owner of a tactical mobility company he, they train like special forces and first responders and people like that. They train them in tactical mobility, how to protect themselves, how to evade, how to whatever, all this stuff. I don't even know all of it. But he said the number one problem that they have to help employers address, whether it's fire departments or Navy SEALs, the number one thing that they have to teach younger people is soft skills because they don't interact in person. They don't have that human to human connection. They're so used to um, interacting virtually that they don't have the soft skills that the older people have. And you have to have soft skills. And it's not just about because you want to be able to carry on a conversation. It's so that you can recognize subtle things around you and and be able to translate what's going on so you know in a military person or first responder that's life or death so i thought it was really interesting when he told me and it, this was a couple years ago so it's probably getting even more so he said that is their number one problem that they have to help solve that's a huge problem I mean, it really is mm -hmm. people not, you know, and that's the same thing in, in my industry where I talk to people and even, I mean, little things that people don't pay attention to detail, you know, uh, it's my background in the military that, you know, the small stuff's very important because if you can't do the small stuff, you can't handle the big stuff. And I try to explain that to my staff. It's like, all right, before you send that letter out, double check everything on there is correct because we, you don't want to have any little parts wrong because that means we can't do the rest of it if we can't get the letter right. Exactly. And, um, yeah. yeah, you're so right. 
I think you will. We'll stop at that. Okay. <laughs> I really enjoyed talking with you, Ed. I know you and I could talk all day, but we both have things we got to do, right? That is correct. And I want to thank our <laughs> listeners for coming here today and listening to Inner Edison. I want to thank Lisa for joining us today and telling her story. I appreciate that. And then if you're listening to this on YouTube, or I should say watching it on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe. And Lisa, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and telling your story. Thank you, Ed. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for what you're doing to help veterans also. Well, thank you so much. And if you, if you want to know about that, just go to find me on Helping the Brave on Facebook. We do lives Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2.30 Eastern, I mean, 2.30 Pacific.